Hi there. So these are some things I'm thinking about and working on. I'm going to mention, of course, like I do frequently, uh, a chapter in Lila and in Korean Tomorrow's or a chapter in The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Because as you know, in this channel, I typically refer to the work of Robert Persig to help me understand things. So in order to understand what I'm talking about, um, you might reference chapter 26 of Lila. So I've been working on understanding C.S. Lewis miracles and other material surrounding that, which means I've been listening a lot to Paul Vanderclay. And as I realized, Paul's channel is such a good hub for this corner. And what's interesting to me about this corner, because besides the three patron saints, let's say, of this little corner, uh, which would be Paul, Jonathan Pajot, and uh, John Verveke, Paul incorporates the whole Venn diagram of the corner. So anything that's happening in this hub is updated and almost daily, thankfully. So it's a great resource. And there are a couple points in C.S. Lewis that I'm really mulling over that he proposes. And from what I can tell, eternal reason and eternal moral wisdom, eternal reason and eternal moral wisdom are not of nature. They are supernatural or, in other words, they're God-given. Reason is what makes things coherent and morality is how we know the good. And I think the reason that Lewis might be talking about is that coherency making reason versus cold analytical reason. And that's kind of like Persig's spiritual reason, and I don't, it's, it's, in, it's in The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is reasoning in the moment as to what's best next, let's just say, and always uh, framed or often framed in that book in terms of what's the next move in terms of maintaining your motorcycle. So you'll be all the time trying to figure out what the, what the next best move is. And that kind of reason is exactly cold analytical reason, which kind of is divorced from all the lower levels and just is operating in the intellectual domain. And as we've been talking about uh, the church of reason, let's say, and as we've been talking about, that's a lot of what the problem is these days and the problem that Persig was addressing in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and the Meaning Crisis. I would say Persig and Lewis definitely differ on morality, though. And I know from mere Christianity that there, according to Lewis, there is a moral law. And this is more conceptualized as something manifest versus Persig's morality, which is, and that, you know, his, his morality is manifest in the sense that he delineates the four levels. You give the upper, the level above when you have a moral dilemma, say, between biological and social, you favor in terms of the social, not always 100% like that, because sometimes the social level will be so rigid, the social pattern will be so rigid that it needs a little bit of biological quality to fix it. So it's not, uh, it's not a it's, it's not a list of how you need to operate in the world. It's more of sort of a rough uh, guideline. And I don't think that um, Lewis would appreciate that as much because he's really talking about a social level morality that's fixed to some extent. And the, the, dynamis, the dynamicism in Lewis is more from, is more from his dynamic, um, dynamic Christianity really, a really dynamic way of understanding Christianity in terms of being very open to all points of view, but, but slowly, you know, but gently guiding us into the Christian direction by getting kind of in our space and then using coherent making, coherency making reason to guide us in the right direction. So the main line of argument in this corner is that modern post-enlightenment consciousness has cut us off from meaning in some way or another, generally by favoring a materialist, rationalist, atomist, left hemisphere, intellectual, prom uh, propositional worldview over a fuller way of understanding reality, of, over a, a holistic way of understanding reality that integrates all ways of knowing. So that's basically the argument in this corner. 
Therefore, it's the quest of members in this corner to entice us to see reality in this more integrated way, which means reevaluating our personal and community and global priorities even, or our sensibility of, of what's happening in the world. And as is transpiring in this corner very much, returning to ancient wisdom and revivifying ancient wisdom to guide us and using these tools to put on a new set of lenses, which uh, actually the new lenses should probably come first. So I guess what we're figuring out is what our prescription is. So I've been plowing into C.S. Lewis' miracles, like I said, uh, both through his work and through how it's discussed in this corner, and obviously through the lens of Paul and, and um, uh, John Peugeot and uh, John Verveke, and um, probably more Paul and, and, and Peugeot than John Verveke, uh, and probably more Paul than John Jonathan Peugeot, but also J.P. Marceau. And it's an interesting journey. I've only read the first few chapters of Miracles, but I found a couple of good synopses, plus the video I mentioned, I think, in the first video I did in sort of this series, I guess you could say, which is a great essay on Miracles that seems to summarize the book, and it's read by Lewis himself. And when he's reading it, it reminds me of, a, of an album I listened to over and over and over again as a child, which is Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. <laughs> he sounds a lot like T.S. Eliot, but I think that that, maybe that uh, erudite English uh, way of speaking kind of was shared by this group of people. I don't know, I'm sure this group is, what was this, a Socratic club? or a, <laughs> I, I better not get into that, I don't know. So what Miracles seems to be revealing to me, and also, I'm talking about when J.P. Marceau was talking about this, he wrote an article for um, Orthodox, no, not Orthodox Arts Journal, uh, The Symbolic World. And it really went over well with a lot of, with Peugeot, of course, and with Verveke, of course, because it was about Verveke's relevance realization. And it's an old video, it's a year uh, old, and J.P. Marceau talked to um, all three about this article. And it also, you know, I'm going to bring Pearson into this, obviously, because relevance realization is, is in John, John and I talked in this about this in our um, discussion a couple of years ago, I'd love to talk to him about it again, because I know so much more about Pearson now than I did then. And I'm more uh, invested, I guess, I, I mean, you probably don't realize it, because I don't put out that many videos, but I'm more invested in this corner than I ever was. And I see so uh, so obviously to me at this point how valuable it is, not just intellectually, but socially. I mean, I'm really making some friendships in this corner, which I treasure. So here's how person can aid in this conversation. And chapter 26 of Lila seems to be lining up here. I'm not really going to go into chapter 26 yet. Again, I was hoping to have this more down than I do. But what I do want to say is chapter 26 goes into the meaning of insanity, for one. What does insanity mean? Um, and of course, what does it mean biologically, socially, and intellectually? And one thing we can say about miracles is that they seem insane. And they certainly seem insane to, let's say, uh, atheists who just say that they're superstitions and this is very primitive and now we have science, we don't have to worry about this stuff. But also, people going through a mystical experience can be deemed insane when it's happen, happening. And that means, you know, hearing God and hearing voices can be confused. And chapter 26 is roughly about that lens in which we see reality and how critical it is to get the right prescription, but sometimes we just have to throw the glasses away altogether. So the source of enlightenment is God breaking through, like the Dharmakaya light, that explanation of everything. When you, when, you feel, when you see that light, when it breaks through, when you have revelation. And in chapter 26, the Dharmakaya light is an indication that there's a dynamic intrusion upon a static situation, is, is how it's put in that, in that um, chapter. So when the lens breaks and falls away, we see through to the miraculous. And you could say the Brujo, remember the Brujo, the uh, guy who saved his tribe and became the leader, was a savior. And that what he did was miraculous because he saw through. 
and he seemed insane, but he wasn't, because insanity would mean that the brujo, what he did was for himself alone, and in his own little culture of one, and that's what the window peeping seemed like, that, that seemed like that was just for him, and that this was valuable to him and not to anyone else, so they didn't feel like this guy really saw through, but he did. And the miraculousness of what the brujo did was to see where the culture could go, better than anyone and before anyone else. And eventually, of course, the tribe joined him and made him the leader. So C.S. Lewis' miracles represent what God does miraculously. These are distillations of the miracles that happen all the time and toward the better and toward meaning, water into wine, for example. You know, you crush some grapes and they're pre that's pretty valueless unless you like grape juice, but it, it turns into this you know, this very valuable things, it made the wedding a wonderful social event versus kind of a dreary and dry thing where you had nothing to drink but water. Uh, curing the sick. There's eventually, if you believe that you're going to get better, and this is in, in, the, uh, in the conversation between J.P. Marceau and, and um, Jonathan Pajot, they're talking about the the, the significance of the placebo effect. So if you believe God is going to help you get better, very frequently you do. Calming the storm. If you just wait out the weather, it's going to change. And these are all things that God has given us. And these tales distill what is truly God-given into a story. Persig, I would say, like many of us in this corner, is attempting to bridge the gap between the naturalist and the supernaturalist. Although he specifically states that he doesn't see the Dharmakaya light as supernatural, that light is an indication of the presence of dynamic quality. The metaphysical quality is a monism, and, the, and that quality is something, the good. And this is reminiscent of the god of Plotinus, who Persig respects, and that is the animating principle that is absolutely inaccessible. It is this good that is buried deep, it, it, it's not even buried. It's omnipresent, but never perceptible, let's say. And I'm going to, again, later when we, we talk about Karen's interview, I want to talk about this a little. So the god of Plotinus is that, is that animating principle that stands outside of the manifest universe, but expresses itself through the universe. I don't know how to, I still don't know how to line up the metaphysics of quality with Plotinus and Neoplatonism and Plato's, especially not Plato's because I still don't know enough about Plato. So I don't want to, you know, try to map anything on. But, but, but that Tao, you could say, is always there. And it expresses itself through the universe. So Persig thinks that rationality comes from our mythos, comes from, let's say, our social patterns, like a branch of a tree. So it's evolved, but if you look at it through a Neoplatonic, uh, Neoplatonic lens, as in the principle, the dynamic quality is the signal from God. And then it can align with Lewis, who says, a man's rational thinking is just so much of his share in, in eternal reason as the state of his brain allows to become operative. So this is interesting, both in terms of the Neoplatonic ideas being kicked around in this corner that intellect will somehow connect us to the source of coherence and good, coherence being rationality, good being morality. And then, of course, in terms of Piercing, that quality and God are deeply connected. So that drive for the good is not inherent in nature, but supernaturally occurs to drive all the quality events that create nature. And that makes sense in a way, but I need to explore that further. The other day, so now I'm going to talk about Karen's great interview with Wolfgang Smith. And it was really compelling for me for a lot of reasons. Karen gets the best interviews. And this, this, I like a lot of Karen's interviews. I love the interviews with Glenn. But this was, this really, really stood out. Then the, kind of in the same way the ones with Glenn do. So he, so Wolfgang Smith is like a, a revered physicist and has his own fringe beliefs, and they are tied up a lot with his religious beliefs, I would say. And there's something about this interview, and Paul said Karen was really enthusiastic about it and shared it with him in ways that she does in other interviews. 
because Wolfgang articulates the problem that this corner articulates and in a new lens in which to see reality. And that, of course, is the beginning of the antidote of the meaning crisis, a new lens in which to see reality. Not just to know there is a meaning crisis, but to have the frame, the framework to make some quality decisions as to what to do about it. But that means putting on the right pair of glasses, having the right prescription. All right, the interesting thing about Wolfgang is that he's a blindingly brilliant man, probably equal to Persig in the realm of IQ and precociousness. I hate that word, but you know what I mean. Um, so Wolfgang went to college, Cornell. Cornell? No. It might have been Cornell. He went to college at age 15 and by the t age 18 got three bachelor's degrees <laughs> in physics, mathematics, and philosophy. Very similar to Persig. And interesting, their approach to academia is kind of similar. They kind of thought, you know, you got to play along. And he came to his realizations a little bit more academically, it seems, than Persig did. He, re he refers to people who are influences more in a way than Persig does. I mean, at least other academi academicians. So this probably would be what Phaedrus would have done if dynamic quality hadn't got the better of him. And I think we're grateful that both of these men exist and did what they did, even though they were different things. So Wolfgang pretty much says that scientism is our metaphysics now. And as we look downward and downward for the bottom of things, which somehow we've come to believe is the essence of truth and reality, scientism, um, let me, let me just give a definition of scientism. Scientism is the view that science and the scientific method are the best or only objective means by which people should determine normative and epistemological values. So objectivity, of course, is the best thing in subject-object metaphysics. That's what you're aiming for. So this is he talks about Newtonian physics a little. This is from a paper he wrote called The Hidden Connection. And when he talks about Newtonian physics, let's define Newtonian physics is a notion of the whole rigorously reducible to its infinitesimal parts. Science in the modern sense would never have gotten off the ground without the benefit of a worldview which is drastically oversimplified. The success of this dubious paradigm has been spectacular and unprecedented. From the publication of Newton's Principia in 1687 to the beginning of the 20th century, it was regarded not simply as a paradigm, but indeed as the master key which in principle unlocks all the secrets of nature, from the motion of the stars and planets to the functioning of her minutest parts. So a whole, the, what does Lewis say again? The whole show. <laughs> So the first thing that strikes me with Wolfgang is his way of describing why and how we've been waylaid. So he says it's Democritus, a pre-Socratic, who fed this idea into the system, which was taken up years later by Descartes. Of course, people interpret, it, uh, interpret the origin of the problem of scientism or materialism or atomism in different ways. Persig said um, that it was because Plato started to understand pure intellect or truth as a superior as superior to value or arete. So arete, value, became subservient to truth because, and, and, you know, there's, I don't know Plato very well, so I can't go too much into this. And he's not saying that Plato, there's something wrong with him. Remember, it's Phaedrus who was mad at Plato, not Persig per se. I, think, I know that Persig appreciates uh, Plato and even wrote an um, introduction to a small book on Plato. But we're talking about arete, value, versus um, this objectivity, truth, intellect. And this is where the first division occurred, according to Persig. And interestingly, Persig thinks that arete itself goes back beyond the pre-Socratics to, um, to ancient India, which is exactly what Wolfgang believes also. Wolfgang attributes the problem to Descartes. But whatever the case, the problem is our loss of understanding as the world, 
as, as wholes, as the world as wholes versus parts. And this result in Descartes, Descartes has, the ghost of Descartes has resulted in an absolute certainty that everything is built of what's below. Wolfgang thinks that this is the biggest problem, I think, from what I understand. And he refers to a corporeal reality, of which physical reality, this, this um, matter, you know, corporeal reality is mind matter before it was separated by Descartes. Physical reality is matter. And it's just an intellectual description. And it's certainly an intellectual description of modern physicists. Corporeal reality is the whole show. It is the experience, I, I mean, I'm going to try to do my best at, at, at describing what I think he means. It's this physical structure that's very predictable, and it's the qualities too, the, the way it is perceived, the way it smells, tastes, whatever. It is its presence in reality and in integration with us, and the quality experience we have of this, of this item perhaps the quality of experience of how this item is created and then how we experience after the fact. The physical presence of this item, say an apple, with all its qualities. And it's funny, I'm using parts-based language even in this description. That's how entrenched this way of thinking is. And I don't know if we can get out of that. How do we convey a message if we don't do it with this language? Another aspect I find fascinating about Wolfgang's icon and this is the icon that is on the cover of his book, which is an icon of ancient wisdom. It's the icon of monism, which is ancient wisdom. And as you can see in this Wikipedia entry, the icon represents the universe in terms of principle and manifestation. The icon is everywhere. It's in apples when you cut them open, sunflowers where the seeds radiate out from the center. It's in all that golden, golden ratio stuff. It's roughly the basic icon of Peugeot's language of uh, Matthew Peugeot's language of creation. It's a seed. It's a sperm. Um, it's it's a tornado. It's an atomic cloud. There's a center, and there's manifestation, and that icon represents the nature of reality. So I want to mention someone here that is rather controversial in terms. Um, of, well, for one, he has absolute certainty about the way things are. He's also a bit of a misanthrope and has no trouble insulting other people. I have a lot of affection for him. This is Ken Wheeler, who's also a Neoplatonist and has many videos that explain the nature of things coherently based on ancient wisdom, really line up a lot with, um, with, with Wolfgang Smith. So it's worth checking out some of his stuff and see how it overlaps. And I think someone who could be integrated in this corner with a grain of salt because um, because Ken really believes that his theory is the whole show. And as Paul has pointed out to me, his theory is, is a wonderful description of the inorganic level. Uh, it's more than that, but, but, but Ken is someone who kind of dismisses the social level and maybe even dismisses the biological to some extent, certainly dismisses the social, which is part of the problem we're having these days. But as a tool for understanding a lot of this early metaphysics and getting back to the wisdom of the ancients, Ken, Ken Wheeler is one of the best. So the idea of the center I get from him, and it is mind-blowing to me. So I'll put a link below to uh, one of his videos that kind of describe this. You'll find a lot of overlap. You'll, I, I suggest you go around his videos and see what he has to say. And this is what I find so fascinating. The center is where everything comes from, but it is outside of time and space. It doesn't exist in terms of our notion of physica, physical existence. And the implication of this is that it's always there and always been there. There's no beginning and end in the big picture, right? This is something that is always present and manifests itself through things we can perceive, but we cannot perceive it is the force of, of reality. Ken is going to say it's the ether, one of the way he describes it. And, and one thing that's really interesting about Ken Wheeler's theory is that he goes back to the ether theory of, say, Tesla and the early electrical um, theorists and gives much co coherent physics in my estimation than the one that we're dealing with now. But I, I don't understand much about physics, so that's all I better say about that. 
So the principle that drives all creation, and I think you could say potential or quality, dynamic quality is the valuing, creative force, so to speak, and the apple itself is the static pattern of value. So that dot in the center of the monad is the whole show. And the lens is the one we are trying to adopt here in this corner in some fashion. Don't know how yet. Now for the levels for Wolfgang, the reflections of a, what he calls a tripartite domain, corporeal, subjective, I guess you could say, and spiritual. So you have the middle, and then you have the, circ the horizontal circumference, which is where everything happens that we perceive, or at least we, and then there's this, this, in, this um, intermediary world, which I don't understand yet. He says it's full of demons. But supposedly this is a platonic notion, so I guess I have to explore that later. I don't know what, exactly what he means to that about that, but I will talk about his notion of evil. And Wolfgang's notion of evil seems to line up perfectly with Pajot's, uh, like the flying spaghetti monster. It's the inversion, the inversion, worshipping of the bottom, the mud, something beside, you know, turning around the worship to the bottom. And evil is that worship of the bottom, even though we're not intentionally, people who do this are not intentionally being evil. It's like replacing, like taking this tool and saying it's the, the whole show. And that's why Lucifer is pure intellect, pure, cold, analytical, classical reason, the parts, whereas Christ tells us to consider the lilies, which is the whole. So I guess in this corner, it's useful to know both Plato and physics. So there's always something to learn, right? By the way, there's a documentary of Wolfgang, and he agrees, uh, this is what I understand from the documentary, that he agrees with quantum in that pulling together of potential noted by Heisenberg is in fact how the bottom of things aligns with the orientation factor of above. Logos, you could say. Quantum particles aren't particles at all. And they don't build up as such. They don't build up like bricks or particles, but they're rather expressions of potential that receive their messages from on high and therefore strive upwards. Vertical, um, evolu vertical. Oh dear, I, what a bad time to forget his term. <laughs> anyway, valuing and thus the creation of the universe. So I hope that makes sense. And I'll see you next time.